Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Policy Pizza and Pint. My name is Robert Ermel, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. And tonight's event is in partnership with the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. To find out more about the Institute and what we do, I'd like you to take a look at the handbills on your table, or to check us out at MIPR.ca. The basic guaranteed income model of economic security for all has been gaining attention in policy circles around the country. The model will provide a minimum income for all Manitobans and Canadians, instead of the government's current piecemeal approach to social assistance and income support programs. Tonight's panel will cover the specifics of what basic income means for Manitoba and Canada, and discuss the community's thoughts on this issue. Our moderator this evening is Shannon Sanford, Dr. Shannon Sanford, Perspectives and Policy Editor at the Winnipeg Free Press. And our panel tonight, we have Dr. Evelyn Forger from the Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba, Mr. Yudin de Vispera from the Institute for Health and Social Policy at McGill University, and Ms. Jessica Dumas from the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce. The detailed biography, biographies can be found in your welcome papers. Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback forms. Many of our event ideas come from your feedback, so please fill them out. I'll now pass the mic over to Shannon to uh, start the event. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight, and uh, it's actually not a horrible night to be out, so it's, uh, we, we actually ordered special weather just for you people from Montreal. That's what we did. Um, so thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to talk about the idea of basic income, and I understand there's been a whole, sort of a whole day of having conversations about basic income. The, uh, the format that we're going to follow tonight is we're going to allow for uh, Jorgen to go first, no, uh, me, uh, uh, Dr. Forget to go first, and then Jorgen, and then we'll have Jesse that will be coming up uh, third on, on the list of things to go. So we'll start with you, and um, there's no uh, particular time frame, but if you go for an hour and a half, I will have to, do, to cut your mic, so go for it. Thanks very much. Please stop me before I go for an hour and a half. Um, before I start, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about what we mean by guaranteed annual income. And there are really two basic models that we're going to be talking about tonight. The first is very, very simple. Every person or every adult receives exactly the same amount of money from government sources. So that is, everybody would receive X dollars a year, and we'd leave it to the tax system to raise enough money to pay for that. As you can imagine, that tends to be a very expensive, a very costly um, way of delivering a basic income. And it's not one that's uh, received nearly as much attention as the second version that we'll be paying a little bit more attention to. The second version is what we usually call a guaranteed annual income. And the easiest way to think of that is to think of it as a refundable tax credit. It works very much like the child benefit. If you have no income from any other source, you receive a certain amount of money from the government. And then as your income increases from all other sources, especially from labor income, your benefit is reduced, but it's reduced less than proportionally. So for example, if you go out into the labor market and earn $1,000, your benefit might be reduced by $500. Thank you. Okay, now there are three reasons, uh, three basic reasons why a lot of people would advocate for this version of a guaranteed income. First of all, it affords all families the dignity of being able to meet their basic needs without having to satisfy some of the very many regulations that are required to qualify for things like employment and income assistance. Secondly, it's very simple. It's very transparent, although Logan's going to talk a little bit about how it's not so simple to bring it about. But the system itself is very simple. It's simple to understand. The fewer regulations there are, the less opportunity there is for people to gain the system, and the cheaper it is for government to administer. And third, and perhaps most important, if a client always gets to keep some portion of the benefit when they go out to work, then you've created a really strong incentive for people to go out to work. People are always better off if they work than if they don't work. At the same time, the client's not forced to work in order to receive the benefit, and therefore they're not at the mercy of potential employers. They don't have to take bad jobs. It empowers workers. It empowers recipients. So that's what we mean by guaranteed income. That's why we might think it a good thing. And I think just by way of introducing Logan, I'm going to talk a little bit about the special place that Manitoba has in the history of guaranteed income in Canada. 
Um, as, as some of you probably know, we in Manitoba had our own little experiment with guaranteed income called Mean Income that operated in the mid-1970s. There were two experimental sites in Manitoba, one in the city of Winnipeg and the second in the small town of Dauphin, Manitoba. It was paid for partly by the federal government, 75% of the costs were paid for by the feds and 25% of the costs by the province. The money flowed for four years between 1974 and 1978. Now somewhere between 1974 and 1978, some of the political difficulties Jürgen is going to talk about in a minute happened. Governments changed. They changed at both the federal and the provincial level, and the project lost the kind of political support that was required. And so the project ended. Shortly afterwards, um, some labor economists, particularly Derek Kahn and Wayne Simpson at the University of Manitoba, analyzed the Winnipeg labor market data, and they answered one of the questions that motivated this experiment in the first place. A lot of people were worried that if you give people money for nothing, people are going to quit their jobs. So they gathered the data on the Winnipeg sample, and they analyzed it, and they found that the number of hours people worked overall did fall. It fell by about 13%. But when they looked at it more closely, they found some really interesting regularities. First of all, grown-up people with full-time jobs didn't reduce the number of hours they worked very much. But two groups of workers did. Married women tended to use the guaranteed annual income to buy themselves longer maternity leaves. And here you have to put yourself back into the mindset of the 1970s. Maternity leave in the 1970s was four weeks or six weeks. And so when they left the labor market in order to give birth, they decided to stay home for a little bit longer with the newborn. Positive social outcome, I think. Now, the second group of workers that reduced the number of hours, and here the language you use is really, really important. If you're not a supporter of a guaranteed income, you say things like, young and attached males reduce the number of hours they work by up to 80%. And that sort of creates a picture in people's minds of irresponsible young people running away from their um, job responsibilities. If you use a slightly different language, you get a little bit closer to the truth. Um, what we're talking about are adolescents. It turns out that teenage, teenagers, young men in particular, reduced the number of hours they worked, um, mostly because they took their first full-time job at a slightly older age. So that's really where my project started. About five years ago, I went to see if we could find any trace of the data from the income experiment to find out what actually happened to people's lives. How did it affect the quality of life? And the first thing I did was to look for those young and attached males who were running away from their job opportunities, and I discovered them. I discovered them in high school. Um, they, um, they, they, um, in fact, the, the high school completion rate increased pretty dramatically in Dauphin during the period of this experiment. So one of the consequences of guaranteed annual income was an increased investment in um, completing high school in education. Um, I also looked at the health data, and I discovered that hospitalization rates fell for recipients by about 8.5% relative to a control group. Now, it's hard to put that in context, but at the time, Canada was spending about $10 billion a year on hospitals, so right now we're spending over $50 billion a year on hospitals. If hospitalizations fall by 8.5%, we're talking about somewhere between 4 and $5 billion worth of savings and social programs. I found a similar reduction in visits to family doctors. And when I looked a little more closely on the data, almost all of that reduction was due to mental health issues, reductions in stress for families. I looked to see if there were any negative consequences. Um, and what was I looking for? A lot of people worried that there might be an increase in the birth rate. If your um, benefit depends on the size of your families, you've sort of created an incentive for people to have more babies. Not surprisingly, there was no huge baby boom during the income experiment. That didn't happen. And I also looked to see what happened to family stability. There were a lot of people who were worried that if you, if you guaranteed people an annual income, it might increase marital instability. It might increase the divorce rate. 
you'll be very happy to know that the Canadian family survived the assault. There was no increase in the divorce rate with the guaranteed annual income. So just by way of introducing Morgan then, I think I can say that Manitoba's experience with m income was a resounding success. If we measure it in terms of quality of life, if we measure it in terms of savings and other related social programs, I think without a doubt a guaranteed annual income was a very good thing for the people who got to participate in the mid-1970s in Manitoba. Thanks. Thank you.